is a wonderful day to praise the Lord this morning. Let me read to you these verses in Psalm chapter 42 verses 5 and 8 to 11. Why are you in despair, my soul? And why are you restless within me? Wait for God, for I will again praise Him. For the help of His presence, my God. The Lord will send His goodness in the daytime, and His song will be with me in the night. A prayer to the God of my life. I will say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why do I go about mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? As a shattering of my bones, my adversaries taunt me. While they say to me all day long, Where is your God? Why are you in despair, my soul? And why are you restless within me? Wait for God, for I will again praise Him for the help of His presence, my God. In these times where fear and doubt hits us, not only because of the rising cases on COVID and the uncertainty of what tomorrow brings, let us be mindful that God hears our call for help. He is always there to lift us up and calm our hearts. Let us put our trust in the Lord because there is no one like Him. As the song says, His mercy flows like a river so wide, and healing comes from His hand. Keep the faith. God has planned something great for us. As the deer panted for the water, so my soul longed after Thee. You alone are my heart's desire. Oh, how 
sweet to trust in Jesus, just to trust His cleansing blood, just in simple faith to plunge me need the healing cleansing blood. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust Him, how I pray. Just trust that God will win us over our battles. Please continue singing with us this morning and proclaim that He is truly the mighty King of Kings and Lord of all. I heard an old, old story How a Savior came from glory How He gave His life on Calvary To save a wretch like me I heard about His groaning Of His precious blood atoning Then I repented of my sins And won the victory Oh, victory! Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with His redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew Him, and all my love is to Him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing blood. I heard about His healing 
dispensing far revealing how he made the lame to walk again and caused the blind to see and then I cried dear Jesus come and heal my broken spirit and somehow Jesus came and brought to me the victory oh victory Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with His redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew Him, and all my love is to Him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. I heard about he has built for me in glory And I heard about the streets of gold Beyond the crystal sea About the angels singing And the old redemption story And some sweet day I'll sing up there The song of victory Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with His redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew Him, and all my love is to Him. He plunged me to victory. I will call upon the Lord, who is ready to be praised. So shall I be saved from my enemies, I will call upon the Lord. The Lord liveth, and blessed be the rock, and let the God of my salvation be exalted. The Lord liveth, and blessed be the rock, and let the God of my salvation be exalted. Every day with Jesus is sweeter than the day before. Every day with Jesus I love Him more and more. Jesus saves and keeps me and He's what I'm waiting for. Every day with Jesus is sweeter than the day before. Good morning. I'm Pastor Hoagie, and I'm glad to be with you this morning for our Bible study at Faith Baptist Church, South Metro. What an opportunity. We're already half through the month of January. Can you imagine how fast time goes? It just speeds by, and we hardly realize that every day we're getting closer and closer to the time that Jesus Christ will return and liberate the believers, those who have trusted Jesus Christ as their personal Savior, liberate us from this present world. But while we're here, we have to deal with certain things, and I want to talk to you this morning about that. I want to talk to you about dealing with discouragement. That's right, dealing with discouragement, and we're going to be looking at Nehemiah chapter 4, so get your Bible and let's go to Nehemiah chapter 4. We'll look at verses twenty uh, 1 through 23, and it's going to be a good study. As I was preparing for this particular study today, I began thinking about times in my life when I began a job thinking that it would only take a little while, and then find out with everything that we do on the job, it becomes more complicated. Do you ever have that happen? I once 
started on a plumbing job several years ago to just replace a leaky sink drain at the bottom of the sink. Well, when I replaced the fitting, put a new one in there, I was tightening the nut on the bottom so that it wouldn't leak. And all of a sudden, the entire bottom of the sink fell out. And I had to replace the entire sink. I sure wasn't planning on that. My goodness, no. Well, Nehemiah, the man we're going to be looking at, was a man who probably didn't realize how complicated life could get when he took on a project. It had the appearance of, well, being maybe difficult, and but he had help, and he said, "I we can do this, and being harmless is innocent, rather simple perhaps, but after all, what could be difficult about building a wall around a city? In Nehemiah chapter 2 and verse 5, and as, as an introduction, here's what happened. He said to the king, if it please the king, and if thy servants have found favor in thy sight, that thou would send me unto Judah, unto the city of my father's sepulchers, that I may build it. I'm sure he thought that he would have that wall completed in just a few weeks, and then he could go back to Persia and resume, re resume his life, you know, just get on. But it wasn't going to happen. He looked over the shoulders of those workmen. He knew he was dealing with a mess. And we're going to be reading the entire chapter. So get your Bible and let's look at it, if you would, please in chapter 4, verses 1 through 23. But, it says, it came to pass that when Samballot heard that we builded the wall, he was wroth, and he took great indignation and mocked the Jews. Verse 2, and he spake before his brethren and the army of Samaria and said, what do these feeble Jews? Will they fortify themselves? Will they sacrifice? Will they make an end in a day? Will they revive the stones out of the heaps of the rubbish which are burned? Now Tobiah the Ammonite was by him, and he said, <laughs> even that which they build, if a fox go up, he shall even break down their stone wall. Nehemiah turns to God and he says, Hear, O God, for we are despised and turn their reproach upon their own head and give them for a prey in the land of captivity and cover not their iniquity and let not their sin be blotted out from before thee, for they have provoked thee to anger before the builders. So built we the wall, and all the wall was joined together unto the half thereof, for the people had a mind to work. But it came to pass that when Samballot and Tobiah and the Arabians and the Ammonites and the Ashdodites heard that the walls of Jerusalem were made up and that the breaches began to be stopped, then they were very wroth and conspired with all of them together to come and to fight against Jerusalem and to hinder it. Look at verse 9. Nevertheless, we made our prayer unto our God and set a watch against them day and night because of them. And Judah said, the strength of the bearers of burdens is decayed, and there's much rubbish so that we are not able to build the wall. And our adversary said, they shall not know, neither see, till we come in the midst of them and slay them and cause the work to cease. It came to pass that when the Jews, which dwelt by them, came and they saw this, they said unto uh, us ten times from all places, whence ye shall return unto us they will be upon you. Therefore, verse 13, therefore, 
said I in the lower places behind the wall and on the higher places, I even set the people after their families with their swords and spears and their bows. And I looked and rose up and said unto the nobles and to the rulers and to the rest of the people, be not ye afraid of them. Remember the Lord, which is great and terrible and fight for your brethren, your sons and your daughters your wives and your houses. So they go back to work. In verse 15, and it came to pass when our enemies heard that it was known unto us and God had brought their counsel to naught, that we returned all of us to the wall, every one unto his work. And it came to pass from that time forth that the half of my servants wrought in the work and the other half of them held both the spears, the shields, and the bows, and the haberjons, and the rulers were behind all the house of Judah. They which builded on the wall, and they that bear burdens with those that laid it. And everyone with all of his hands wrought in the work, and with the other hand held a weapon. For the builders, everyone had his sword girded by his side, and so builded. And he that sounded the trumpet was by me. Now verse 19, and I said unto the nobles and to the rulers and to the rest of the people, the work is great and large, and we are separated upon the wall, one far from another. In what place therefore you hear the sound of the trumpet, resort ye thither unto us, our God shall fight for us. So we labored in the work, and half of them held the spears from the rising of the morning till the stars appeared. Likewise, all the same time said I unto the people, let every one with his servant lodge within Jerusalem, that in the night they may be a guard to us and labor on the day. So neither I, nor my brethren, nor my servants, nor the men of the guard which followed me, none of us put off our clothes, saving that everyone put them off for washing. Wow, that's quite a story. You see, the more Nehemiah had tried to alleviate the problems, the greater they became. Verse 3 tells us, even that which they build, if a fox go up, he shall even break down their stone wall. There was mockery. There was uh, uh, all of the things that, that came, sarcasm. These people, uh, the, the, the ones that came against Nehemiah and those who were building the wall, uh, the, the, the sarcasm and the criticism, and then that opposition that they had, the criticism and the opposition, and, and, and finally, it ended up with a conspiracy in verse 8. The conspiracy was so great that before long, the inevitable took place. What do you think? That's right. Nehemiah was unable to correct the problems, and so it got worse. They multiplied and magnified as time went on. I imagine they thought, well, why would God allow such treatment when Nehemiah's heart was so broken when he heard of the plight of those who were still in Jerusalem? Didn't God have control of the situation? And what the wall rebuilt to protect the city, and then the temple could be rebuilt that had been torn down? Often we can't comprehend all the variables that come our way. Sometimes this happens when we're so close to life that we can't see the bigger picture. But we are living our lives, and all around us, we find a rejection of the Word of God, and we focus on the little incidents and the circumstances. This makes us vulnerable to discouragement. So what I'm saying is this, discouragement is inevitable. The Bible is full of those situations when good and godly people find themselves in conflict and unpleasant situations 
through no fault of their own. Their motives are right. Their actions are right. And even their words are filled with grace. Yet trouble comes. Anyone who is serious about serving God and fighting discouragement should study the life of the Apostle Paul. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 7 through 10, Paul said that we have a treasure in earthen vessels. He was describing the treasure of the gospel and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit and how it is housed in our frail human bodies. There's no power or strength in a clay pot, an earthen vessel, it is said. It's fragile, ugly, and it often leaks. The passing of time only makes the pot weaker. Paul was saying that the power does not come from the pot but from what the pot contains. Let me illustrate it a little bit. Have you ever been involved with sales and sales? I when I was in college, I, I tried to sell insurance. Often there are pep rallies to get everyone pumped up and excited. No negative message in any of them are allowed. Any class that is designed for teaching people how to sell will tell you that you cannot constantly hear negativism without having some of it rub off on you. So it's important that each one of us decide who will we hear. Discouraging people are everywhere. It's imperative that we make choices as to who we will stay around. And if all you hear are negative things, then that is what you become. Remember, you are what you think. And generally, we think in the light of those who we associate with. We're not judging people, but simply evaluating our surroundings is vitally important. Remember, discouraging situations happen to everyone. There's no way that we can live our lives in a fallen world without having bad things happen. We just find that in the world today, people want to be spared from every and all forms of danger. And so this led to the crazy rules and regulations that we constantly find ourselves fighting and dealing with. Legal cases are always around us, and we can't seem to be freed from the drain of society in general. Bad news is everywhere, and certain situations just wear us down. You know, even in church, we can find ourselves discouraged. When some in the congregation are discouraged, it can't help but rub off on others. So we're going to examine discouragement and hopefully learn how to overcome discouragement. First of all, let's notice the causes of discouragement. We find them right here in Nehemiah chapter 4. There's nothing that takes the wind out of our sails as quickly as discouragement. It is difficult to cure. Someone has suggested that there are four causes for discouragement. Number one, we see in verse 10 that it could be fatigue. Judah said, the strength of the bearers of burdens is decayed and there is much rubbish so that we are not able to build the wall. In other words, they were just busy about cleaning up. It was just rubbish and trash. And, uh, time, you know, had been there for a long time, and, 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 and uh, it was a mess. And the newness of the project would worn off. Often, we're excited at first when we begin, but when difficulties begin to come, then discouragement comes with it. A loss of strength and even sickness in our day can take an emotional toll as it did with Elijah. In 1 Kings chapter 19, verses 1 through 4, I read this, and Ahab told Jezebel 
all that Elijah had done and with all how he had slain all of those 850 prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger unto Elijah saying, so let the gods do to me and more so if I make not thy life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. In other words, she said, I'm going to kill you by tomorrow. Elijah said, it says about him, when he saw that, that, that message that <laughs> Ahab and, and Jezebel had sent, when he saw, he arose and he went for his life and he came to Beersheba, which belongeth to Judah, and he left his servant there, but he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a juniper tree and he requested for himself that he might die. And he said, it's enough. Now, oh Lord, take away my life, for I'm not better than my father's. What was going on? Well, he was just wore out. And he wasn't thinking correctly. So in verse 10 of here in, in Nehemiah chapter 4, the second thing might be frustration. There was much rubbish still left to the project. It's easy to lose sight of the end when there is so much to do. The builders had lost the vision of the completed wall. Like I was saying earlier, have you ever started a project and say, oh, maybe in an hour or so, half at the most, five hours later, when you're halfway finished, you look back and say, I think the Lord's leading me to do something else. Sometimes we get frustrated we, when we don't progress enough. Uh, I quit. But you know what? God doesn't want us to quit. He's not called us to quit. The third thing is failure when you lose confidence. Discouragement is just around the corner when you lose your confidence because you've lost your heart. And this produces an overwhelming, discouraging sense that you're never going to catch up. How do you think Moses felt when he stood before Pharaoh and Pharaoh rejected him? Exodus chapter 5, verses 1 and 2, it tells us this. And afterward, Moses and Aaron went in and told Pharaoh, thus saith the Lord God of Israel, let my people go that they may hold a feast unto me in the wilderness. Verse 2, and Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord that I should obey his voice to let Israel go? I know not the Lord, neither will I let Israel go. No. He just flat said no. It was failure. But you know what? You look at all of the times there in Exodus when Moses and Aaron kept going back and kept going back and kept going back and kept going back. Why? Because God said, I'm going to give him ample opportunity to repent and let the people go, but he didn't. And people have to realize that when you have opposition from others, it doesn't mean it's over. The story is told that in 1905, at the University of Bern, there was a dissertation that was submitted for a doctorate degree. And on it, in its rejection, the reason was that it was irrelevant and fanciful. But the writer did not quit. His name was Albert Einstein, who became known as a genius. In 1984, an English teacher noted on a teenager's report card a conspicuous lack of success. What do you mean? Who was this young person? This young person was not a young person. 
His name was Winston Churchill. We often allow ourselves to think that failure will finish us, but it will not if we don't let it. The fourth thing is fear. In verse 14, it says, And I looked and rose up and said unto the nobles and to the rulers and to the rest of the people, Be not ye afraid of them. Remember the Lord, who is great and terrible, and fight for your brother and your sons and your daughters, your wives and your houses. There are so many areas of life that we hang on to for tangible security. And we think that if we lose those, they're gone. Nothing can replace them. They may be, as far as an emotional attachment, very, very precious to us. But possessions, someone said, possessions or the loss of them can either make one bitter or better. Job lost his family and his possessions. The full story is seen in Job 1, verses 3 through 13 through 22. All left behind. But if you'll read the last chapter of Job, you'll find out he ended up with double of everything that he had. Remember that one day you will have to leave everything behind. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 7, it says this, we brought nothing into this world, and it's certain we can carry nothing out. Someone said, there is no trailer on the back of a hearse. In the scriptures, you find the saints being crippled by fear. And Paul writes them in Galatians chapter 2, verses 11 through 14. He says this, When Peter was come to Antioch, I withstood him to the face, because he was to be blamed. For before that, certain came from James, he did eat with the Gentiles. But when they were come, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing them which were of the circumcision, or the Jews. And the other Jews dissembled themselves likewise with him, insomuch that Barnabas also was carried away with their dissimulation. In other words, th there was a split in this church. But when I saw, Paul says, that they walked not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel, I, well, he had to go to work. He said, I said unto Peter before them all, if thou, being a Jew, livest after the manner of Gentiles, and not as the and not do as the Jews, why compellest thou the Gentiles to live as the Jews? He withstood him to the face. He said, "You're wrong in what you're doing." Again, in Second Timothy chapter four, verse sixteen, Paul says, "At my first answer." No man stood with me. In other words, when he first got saved and he came to the church, uh, everyone forsook him. And he says, I pray that it may not be added to their charge. The writer Francis Bacon said, it is a miserable state of mind to have a few things to desire and many things to fear. Fear afraid. Paul was not afraid to stand up to Peter, yeah, because Peter was not a pope. He was just a disciple. And Paul said, you're wrong. Well, let's look at some principles in overcoming discouragement. Trying to build this wall was turning out to be no easy task. Sometimes when you have lost all of these, you have to you have that deep feeling that it's not worth what you're doing. How can we handle discouragement? Five techniques that I think you'll see. First of all, in verse 13, in verse 13, unify your efforts toward your goal. Here's what it says in verse 13 of Nehemiah 4. Therefore, Set I in the lower places behind the wall, and on the higher places, I even set the people after their families with their swords, their spears, uh, 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 and their bows. You see, Nehemiah turned the attention from themselves 
to the, the enemy from discouragement of self-pity to the goal of self-preservation. He says, look, stand up, fight, do something. Don't give up. He pulled them together. When brethren are unified toward a goal, there's no time to be worrying about the trouble. Philippians 1.27, only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ, that whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs that ye stand fast in one spirit with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel, Paul said. And in Colossians 1.29, whereunto I also labor, striving according to his working, which worketh in me mightily. Paul said, look, my power's not in myself. I'm being empowered by God to do this. The long-range goal. What is the goal that God has given you in your life? Friend, if... If you have lost sight of this, no wonder you're frustrated. You must have a long-range goal to keep you from being frustrated by short-term failures. Get this principle. So direct your attention to the Lord. In verse 14, Nehemiah gets up in front of the people and he says this, be not afraid of them. Remember the Lord, which is great and terrible. And fight for your brethren, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your houses. There is a battle going on for the truth of God's word that God is in charge and God is doing what he needs to do to protect you and me. I'm afraid that too often we as Christians, we fail to recognize God's in charge of our lives, not men. I just heard from a doctor who said that all of this that's going on has helped to relieve many doctors of their God syndrome. You see, all too often in our lives, we, we think that man is in charge. No, men are not in charge. God's in charge. And this is why Paul said, uh, Nehemiah said what he did. Don't be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who is great and terrible. Remember the Lord. They were looking at the rubbish when they needed to be looking and putting their trust in the Lord. Philippians 4.4 4 says, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Verse 13, he says, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. Don't give up. Serve God with all your heart. People who are discouraged are mainly thinking about themselves. But God and us, we're, we're promised that everything falls into place. Casting all your care, 1 Peter 5, 7. Casting all your care on him. Why? He cares for you. And remember, maintain a balance in your faith and actions. Nehemiah 4, verses 15 through 17. Let's look at that again. Nehemiah 4, 15. And it came to pass when our enemies heard that it was known unto us, and God had brought their counsel to naught, that we returned all of us to the wall, everyone unto his work. And it came to pass from that time forth that the half of my servants wrought in the work, the other half of them held both the spears and the shields and the bows and the hammered guns. And the rulers were behind all the house of Judah. And they which built it on the wall, they that bear burdens with those that laid it, every one with one of his hands, he wrought the work, while in the other hand, he held a weapon. So we've got to stand to contend for the faith, to be strong in the fight and be good soldiers of Jesus Christ, doers of the word, and not hearers only, James says, deceiving ourselves. 
For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like to a man beholding his natural face in the glass. He beholdeth himself and goeth his way and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. We have to put our trust in the Lord, pray fervently, but seize opportunities put before us. Isaiah 50 and verse 10, who is among you that feareth the Lord, that obeyeth the voice of his servant, that walketh in darkness and hath no light? Let him trust in the name of the Lord and stay upon his God. In other words, continue, concentrate, don't be distracted. The fourth thing, he says, determine a rallying point. Back in our story in Nehemiah, we find these words in verse 19 and 20. He says, I said to the nobles, to the rulers, and to the rest of the people, the work is great and large, and we are separated from the wall one far from another. In what place, therefore, ye hear the sound of the trumpet, resort ye thither unto us. Our God shall fight for us. In other words, he was basically saying, we're not alone. Look at all the people around you who want desperately to see our church grow and develop or who struggle with similar problems and challenges. Just when you think you're down and out, you have a friend to pick you up and dust you off. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 4, verse 16, for which cause we faint not. But though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. It means every day is an opportunity. The best rallying point that we can know is heaven. 1 Corinthians 15, 58, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be as steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. What is your ultimate goal, to live forever on this earth or to please God? It's a question we all have to deal with. Number five, serve other people. Verses 21 and 22. What did Nehemiah say in Nehemiah 4? So we labored in the work, and half of them held the spears from the rising of the morning till the stars appeared. Likewise, at the same time, I said to the people, let everyone with his servant stay in Jerusalem, that in the night they may be a guard to us and labor on the day. How much time do you spend helping other people? All of us need to take a long look at our short lives. Serving others is a tremendous part of the gospel. This is what uh, we find about the Lord at the Last Supper. Jesus washed the feet of the disciples. He showed us a pattern to follow if we would be lifted from the pit of discouragement. Paul writes in Galatians 5.13, For brethren, ye have been called unto liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love, what? Serve one another. And then in Hebrews chapter 6, verse 10, For God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love which ye have showed towards his name, in that ye have ministered to the saints and do minister. So the principle is you cannot ignore discouragement. Nehemiah did not ignore it. It's like ignoring a flat tire. Pray all you want, drive all you want. You'll never get the air back into it unless it is fixed. It has to be dealt with. Deal with your discouragement. Our greatest glory is not in never falling but in rising each time we fall. Would you look with me at some principles of application in dealing with discouragement and depression? The following 10 principles are Bible techniques which you can use to deal with depression in your life. This list will give some ideas on how you can make specific application of categorical doctrine to know with real and deal with real world problems. 
Let's look at the number one confession of sin, learning how to use 1 John 1, 9 immediately when you realize you sin. Don't wait until you go to a confessional or forward at the end of a preaching service. Deal with sin when God brings conviction. Number two, the filling of the Holy Spirit. Understand the meaning and the method of achieving this important aspect of the Christian life. Number three, living in the Word. Knowing the Word of God so well that it becomes the automatic way that you look at life. Everything you look around and see should be passed through your understanding of the Word of God. Number four, orientation to grace. Living a life and seeing life as a total gift of the grace of God. Realizing that the good things and the bad things he allows for our good, even the, even the things we don't like. Number five, occupation with Christ. Allowing the Lord Jesus Christ to be the most important being and idea you have every day. You wake up in the morning thinking of him. You go to bed at night thinking of him. You serve through the day thinking of him. Even at work, you can think of him. You're working, you're doing your job as unto the Lord. Number six, the faith rest life. This means resting your future, your fortune, and your faith and confidence in the faith we see in the life of Jesus Christ, knowing him and seeking to learn of him more and more. Number seven, a relaxed mental attitude. What is this? Allowing the circumstances of life to be what they are and conquering the fear that they may bring doesn't mean you want everything to be nice and easy. No, because the exercise of your faith is what builds your faith. Number eight, mastering the details of life. Not letting the details of life master you. Understanding life in a way that makes you the master living above the ups and downs that life in a sinful world brings our way. Number nine, the capacity to love, which is understanding the aspect of love, these different things about love, and having no ill feelings toward anyone, even those who may consider you their enemy. Number 10, the concept of inner happiness relaxing in the knowledge that God is good, and no matter what comes, you can choose to be happy in Christ, rejoicing in him. We have to understand that discouragement starts with something. Discouragement starts with the germ of self-doubt. Romans 14.23b says, whatsoever is not of faith is sin. We must clearly live by faith, and this can be applied two ways. First of all, faith as a noun. The faith, a belief system that is based on the Word of God, not some nebulous thing that is talked about these days. It's a worldview that says God tells us he's in charge. He's in control. He made the world and us human beings he has a plan and will act in accordance with his character toward us. When man operates in that plan, he finds happiness. When he seeks to go by his own plan and make up his own ways and manipulate, that's exactly what's happened. We're living in a world of COVID today because people manipulated something they shouldn't have. Mankind will only find pain and sorrow and frustration and death. Now, faith is a verb. A life of trust in applying that belief in God, not in man, for he will fail. This means trust and hope, and above all, it means confidence. You see, 
through fear, the germ of discouragement begins to grow, multiply. Soon we lose our way and we weaken and we run and hide. And as it continues, we become virtually useless and downright defeated. We become easy prey for the enemy of our souls. As Peter says in 1 Peter 5, 8, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, is a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. So get this principle, my friend. Life cannot be lived exclusively on an incline. You can't continue to go up, 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 Life will have its valleys and peaks, its downs, its ups, its lows, its highs. Realize that discouragement may be tough to handle, but it is certainly not impossible. Remember, our greatest glory is not in never falling, but in rising each time we fall. Now, friend... If you feel discouraged today, would you do these things? Number one, confess your faithlessness to the Lord. Admit that you are being influenced by the wrong things in this life. Number two, read your Bible daily. Begin a level of communication with the Lord that brings you faith. Remember, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So let him speak to you and you speak to him. Tell him what's on your heart and ask him to show you from his word the answers. Number three, find someone you can be a blessing to. Share your faith in a word and in a lifestyle. And if you look around, you'll find someone that God is placing in your life sphere so that you can influence them with a word of hope and a word of faith. Share what you have. And all of us have been blessed of God. Number four, be faithful to fellowship with others. If you can't get together face-to-face, -to -face, communicate. We have Bible studies. We have times when you can get with other ladies, other men, we have those things that you can join if you'll just take advantage of them. You need to fellowship with others who are positive and have a heart to serve and bless others. Stay away from negative people. In modern terminology, I can say it like this, unfriend them. You may need to kindly tell them that you're not being blessed by their negativity. Look around someone else. Do it with kindness and gently because you're being careful with whom you allow to influence your life. It might be an encouragement for them to change. The fifth thing I want you to remember is know that I am praying that those who hear this message and will determine in their heart to find the joy of the Lord as their strength. Well, this is Pastor Hoagie reminding you that there are many lessons available for you. We have messages and lessons online, live webcasts every week. Brother Paul Camacho teaches life lessons from characters in the Bible following in just a few moments here. Matthew Bautista brings a lesson that you need in the middle of the week for you to make it through that week, Wednesday at 6.30. So, friend, take advantage, overcome, deal with discouragement, deal with these things that God sometimes allows to come our way so that he can receive the honor and the glory from our lives. Father, bless your word today. Encourage hearts because you are the source of all encouragement in our times of discouragement May we go to you for encouragement. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. I'll see you back here next week. Have a great week.